Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another of our Pathway webinars with NHT and Discovery Education. It's great to see everybody. It's great to see so many numbers here, um, huge attendance. So thank you very much for attending on uh, what I'm sure is yet another busy day in another, another busy week, especially with uh, a big week looming next week. I'm very acutely aware that many, many people on the call will have been in school all these months anyway, teaching uh, key workers, children and so forth. But I'm sure uh, you're also preparing for the full return next week. And uh, the very, very best of luck for that. And I really hope it goes well. And I hope that today, as with all of these Pathway webinars, uh, is useful and insightful. And I think it will be. I'm sure it will be. Um, we're going to look at the craft of effective assessment for learning. How can we craft effective assessment for learning with uh, the person who knows all about this, who's written a lot of books around this, and is a real expert in the field of assessment for learning. And I'm really pleased that we're joined by him and more on him in a moment. Uh, we're going to be referencing briefly uh, the Pathway programme, as we often do, but uh, not too much, but we will be mentioning it this afternoon. And if you'd like to find out more, please do. Uh, if you visit the URL there, which I'm sure my colleague will put in the chat stream throughout this afternoon, uh, uh, slash Pathway, and you can find out much more about the programme there with lots of uh, insight into its uh, reach and purpose and scope. Um, and if you'd like to join the discussion, both here this afternoon, please do uh, use the chat stream. I always like to keep my eye on the chat stream and the Q&A. The questions from you because we love having uh, contributions from you. We love it when these things are round tables. And I know the speaker who's going to be joining me in a moment is very happy to uh, address some of your comments and questions if we get time as well throughout the discussion. So, um, well, it, uh, it's great to introduce Mike Charles, experienced middle leader, principal examiner, and author of The Craft of Assessment and The Feedback Pendulum. Brilliant books. I've got them, well worth looking at them. And we were also extremely lucky to get Mike to become an author for us on the Pathway Programme. And he filmed some films and wrote some brilliant thought pieces to accompany that course called The Craft of Assessment for Learning. So it just remains for me to, to welcome Mike. I hope you're there. Yes, you are indeed. Brilliant. It's always good to see that the technology works. We had a little bit of a worry about 20 minutes ago when for some reason my own internet decided to go for a burden. But uh, you look uh, nice and clear. So um, it's great to see you, Mike. Really good to see you there. Love to be Thank here, you for Andrew, joining us. very much. Great for joining us. I know that you've literally just come out of a lesson observation, literally a few moments ago. So my goodness me, keeping it real. Um, for those uh, on the call that aren't familiar with your work, um, there will be a few, but not many. Um, why don't you perhaps begin by telling us just a little bit about your professional journey to date and some of your particular interests, if that's okay. Yes, of course, be happy to. Yeah, um, so I have just come out of um, an observation, a virtual observation. Um, call it an observation, but I think more it's more of a coaching, uh, coaching conversation and support technique. Um, that's what we like to call it in our school. And uh, so yeah, so I'm at, on the ground, as they say, still um, still teaching away, and have been for for now 13 years. So it's my 13th academic year, and um, taught in several different schools. Uh, taught down in the um, Midlands, down south initially, and then moved up north so about four to five years ago and uh, done several different roles as um, sort of head of department. And uh, I was actually head of department in my NQT year. So it was a bit of a baptism of fire, actually. So um, wow. it, I hit the ground running there in terms of, um, of that aspect of teaching. And then uh, been lucky, really, really lucky and had plenty of opportunities to, uh, to work with the exam board as a, as a principal examiner, as you said, and uh, more recently as a, as a trust lead. Uh, in, a, in a new school and, and um, most recently uh, involved in the Charter College for Teaching and elected as a council member, which, is, um, which has been fantastic. And as you yeah. rightly said, um, had the opportunity to work with you last year and join you on the uh, Pathway programme and write that, that yeah. Pathway course, which was um, really sort of uh, enjoyable and enlightening experience and gave me a good opportunity to talk about what I've written about in terms of the craft of assessment and uh, I hope that those that have seen the course so far and, and used it within their schools, um, it's been able to uh, support their implementation of assessment. And I suppose, really, um, it's been ever more so challenging over the last 12 months since we've uh, uh, faced sure. the, the issues of the pandemic. Yeah, for sure. Well, it was terrific. I mean, the course you made was was really terrific and there's and I know you've done these sort of things before, actually, quite a bit, but there's nothing like uh, multiple different cameras and a camera crew staring at you to help you sort of crystallize what it is you want to see <laughs> as clearly as possible and yours was a very clear and concise course really clear 
and uh, so um, I'll be talking a little bit about that afterwards. Um, thank you. Um, great. So 13th year of teaching and what a year. <laughs> Maybe it's a coincidence it's number 13, but um, yeah, really pleased to hear. Um, and, and first job to be, uh, uh, to be head of department is uh, quite a baptism of fire, as you say. So fascinating learning experience for you. Well, why don't we start with just the obvious question. So assessment for learning. Why don't you tell us what that phrase actually means for your perspective? Yeah, I think it's a term that's, that's used quite regularly now in education assessment. And I think that um, it's, I suppose, I think when we think about the pathway program, it's a good analogy of assessment, really. It's, a, it's a, almost like um, you get you go on a pathway as a teacher and, you, and you're always assessing pupils in some way, some shape, some format. And, you, and ultimately, you'll get to a series of locked doors, I, I see it as, and almost those, you want to open those locked doors. But you want to open the right door as a teacher because we put so much effort into assessment and we put so much um, uh, time and financial um, burden as well for teachers and schools into devising effective assessments. We want it to open the right doors, we want it to go on the right path that actually sort of promotes learning. And I think the core aspect of that is that assessment is about unraveling what pupils know. It's about finding out, it's about discovering what they they know and what they don't know and I think that's crucial there, there's two elements to it there um, finding out what they do know and finding out what what they don't know and we want to use that assessment effectively and I think that um, the greater uh, use of effective assessment in particular diagnostic assessments mm. uh, can be really powerful and support in learning and I think there's this three core elements that um, that the research has, has talked about for many years, assessment for learning, assessment as learning, assessment of learning, and um, that, that move between the low stakes assessment to the high stakes assessment. And as we have um, sort of um, explored and discovered through research in, re in sort of um, recent decades, we know that actually low stakes assessment for learning is actually more powerful than lots of high stakes assessment of learning. What do you think, um, what, what do you mean by um, low stakes assessment and high stakes assessment? There's been, a, I suppose, a tendency, and I think we may fall into the trap potentially as we get back into schools in a couple of weeks, whereby we, we with this whole phrase of we need to catch them up. And actually, mm. I think we need to switch the language around because um, we know there's going to be anxiety for teachers, there's going to be um, anxiety for pupils and parents. It, it's inevitable when we get back into, into the school building, but actually we want to make sure that those anxiety levels are, are as low as possible. And I think for many years, and I remember this in the early stage of my career, we fell into a trap of lots of high stakes assessment. We would teach something and we'd put a test in place end of a unit we'd have a test to be really high stakes uh, we'd have to log lots of data for senior leaders and and we'd be tracking that data and we'd have to justify um, the data and that creates that sort of level of anxiety for both the teachers and and the pupils and if we come back to what i said at the start is it taking us down the right pathway are we investing the right time and effort into doing that assessment? And is it unlocking the right door? Or is it merely just unlocking a door that says, yes, I've ticked, I've done the assessment, this, this, this uh, term or this half term, I've ticked that assessment policy, I've logged the marks, I've told the pupils what they've got, and then I'm moving on. And, and that's, my, that's my worry with high stakes assessment. Yeah, absolutely. And so conversely, what, what would low stakes assessment look like for you? I think, first of all, that for low stakes assessment to be effective, we've got to build in that culture of um, it's, we're using assessment as a tool to support, not to, um, not to determine just performance. We yeah. want to use it as a support mechanism to uh, yeah. promote learning. And we want to create a culture whereby our pupils are receptive to um, applying knowledge to different scenarios and through different formative assessment strategies, teachers are able to use it as a responsive tool to say, OK, so we're going down this pathway. I want to know, do they know 
X about the subject? Have they learned it? Is it is it in is it um, has it been learned? Uh, are they able to recall it? So I might do a low stakes quick sort of question and answer session. I might do a low stakes quick application test. I might do a low stakes quick um, uh, sort of retrieval quiz. Is that um, then revealing the information I wanted to reveal. And it's not attaching that high stakes to it. And I think that um, Dylan Williams talked a lot about it and in his work on assessment, that mm. high stakes assessment using lots of grades, marks, percentages become uh, almost like a punishment, a distractor mm. from what mm. actually we want they do. to use assessment for. They do. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to get into a little bit later on into the idea of, um, you know, responsive teaching and assessing because I know that's something that you're really passionate about but before we do why don't we just look briefly perhaps at how you think um, assessment varies in different schools that you've experienced that you've visited that you've consulted with what, what are what are the good and bad habits that you've seen in your career without naming any names <laughs> <laughs> I think um, high stakes assessments that yeah. are used as a tool to determine performance of groups and performance of teachers and 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 pupils um that that's some practice that i've seen that's maybe not been as effective and therefore what inevitably happens as is it's human nature is those assessments will be will um, be written in a way that will ensure pupils perform well because uh, the teacher will want to be seen as as doing well and when they report they'll want to be seen as reporting yeah. um positive results and therefore is it my, my issue with that is what is the point in doing that in the first place because we go along that pathway we get to the door we unlock a door and has it told us what we want to know or or have has that assessment been used merely to um, meet a school expectation and therefore it hasn't really assessed any learning it's just it's just been um, a tick box exercise I think that um, other practices that I've seen that that maybe you would say is not as effective as using like end of topic tests that are in isolation. So right. uh, the traditional, and, and I did this in the past and, and um, I look back at it and think, why did I do it? Teach, teach tectonics in geography, test tectonics at the end of it, give them, get a mark. Okay, they've got 70%. Yeah, they're brilliant at tectonics, let's move on. Then <laughs> do another assessment at the end of, of coast, let's test them there and move on. And actually, we know that isolated assessments are not as effective as, as what I've talked about in, in the book as being cumulative assessments. Right. Um, and also, I think the time scale as well. A lot, a lot of schools put time scales on assessments. We must assess every seven weeks. Yeah, we must assess repeat. every, mm. every uh, 12 weeks. Mm. but without any thought process into why that why that's actually happening that's so true isn't it i'm i'm really struck by um your analogy of unlocking doors i think that's terrific and i've not heard that before i think that's terrific what what do you feel um is behind those doors that we're we're so keen to see because it isn't just knowledge retrieval is it i don't think well maybe no, it is. and i think yeah you're right and i think what what we see a lot in lesson is performance. We don't see learning, we see performance. We see right. um, pupils answering a question that we've given them, it's performance. We see pupils uh, writing um, an answer uh, to, to a test and we see them get maybe five out of six, it's all performance. And I think there's, there's a number of doors that will end up opening and some of them we will, um, some of those doors will be more advantageous than others. We'll open a door and we'll say, right, they've got 60% which just a, it's more of a um, sort of performance related door, I suppose what I would call it. Um, we, we might open another door that actually tells us very little because we set up that assessment actually to tell us what we already knew. knew. <laughs> because we, we just want to perform well as a teacher and we want to give that data that's positive. And actually, most powerful teaching is to unravel what students don't know um, and still haven't learned rather than just unraveling what we expected them to know by fixating an assessment um, to prove that. Um, and I suppose for me that the key door we want to open is from that assessment, what has it told us at that point? 
Yeah. What do we know about what pupils know? What have they learned? What can we do next to, to um, sort of get them on back on the path for where they need to be on that bigger picture of that journey, that curriculum journey, that, that goal, that path that we want to take them up to where it, the milestone is, is it at the end of key stage three, is it the end of key stage four, is it the end of key stage five and so forth. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's fascinating. It's such a good analogy that is. And I think it also emphasizes your point about cumulative assessments because it perhaps sometimes it's too late to wait until the very end of a topic or the end of a term to then um, assess and identify what they don't know because you've already got to move on to the next topic. <laughs> it isn't really formative in that respect, is it? I often used to think it, uh, and found it somewhat frustrating, um, both as a teacher and a parent, I have four children, and um, to get the end of term reports, um, because it was too late at the end of term. <laughs> I understand, I understand that. I've been involved in it a long time, but, um, and so too with tests, a um, bit of both. What would be the ingredients then? Let's get into this that you would recommend that would provide the most impactful assessment in your opinion? Or is that is that too big a question? Do you want to break that down? What strategies would you recommend? Yeah, I think um, it's quite it's quite a broad, broad a um, question. Topic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but I think first of all, fundamentally, the curriculum design, what's, mm. how is the curriculum been set up first? We need to look at what are we teaching? Why are we teaching it where we are? Um, and uh, what is why we put that sequence in place and if we know that and we understand the the fundamentals of our curriculum design uh, almost it's almost like Craig, Craig I, I talked about it, creating a bit of a tapestry our curriculum is a tapestry of of different um, aspects of our subjects the concepts and process that we're teaching and it tells a story um, throughout the duration of their um, time within school and whatever key stage they're, they're looking at so when we've decided what we're teaching when we've got a sequence in place where do we want to put in those assessments those diagnostic assessments and what are we trying to unpick at that point so what what are we trying to unravel at that point along that particular learning journey and i think the idea of um regular frequent formative assessments those responsive aspects on a day-to-day -day basis are really important and doing that on a regular basis basis is really important and um, moving away from this idea that assessment is purely um, a test or it's purely um, a written based exercise because actually it's not we can assess through questioning we know that uh, we we can use questions as a powerful tool to assess we can use um, feedback as a powerful tool to assess where pupils are at. And then something I've talked about, and I think it's, it's, it's moving away as well from like those end of topic tests, but more to those cumulative assessment designs. Something really effective in the school that I'm working in at the minute is having uh, this, this idea of learning cycles which are not linked to what we would class traditionally as half-termly units, but learning cycles that encompass opportunities for teachers to um, formatively assess pupil with a range of different responsive strategies in core teaching weeks, an opportunity to have some form. And I noticed there was a question about, would you advocate any um, summative assessment? I think there should be some yeah, so form of awesome. summative assessment. Absolutely. Yeah. But right not as frequent, not, not attaching any high stakes to it, an opportunity to have some sort of form, a uh, series of formative assessments during those teaching weeks, opportunity to have one sort of standardized summative assessment that isn't, still isn't high stakes, right. and an opportunity to have some time to reflect on what, what my current a school call uh, a gap week. So how can we address those gaps? Actually advocating time to allow teachers and pupils to reflect on what they've learnt in those uh, previous weeks in that learning cycle and then looking at how they can close those gaps before they move on to the next stage of their learning journey and I think that's really important but equally then weaving in those assessments so actually each after each learning cycle the assessments build cumulatively so they're continually assessing knowledge uh, from previous learning cycles and I think that's really important that and it can become quite a complex process but it's about uh, building in 
those aspects of the previous part of the curriculum that link to that uh, aspect of the curriculum that's being taught in that learning cycle. And it comes back to that point that um, we, we know quite well that, uh, that definition of learning is a changing long-term memory. And the more we give pupils opportunity to reflect, the more we give pupils opportunities to overlearn something, the greater the automaticity they will get and the, the greater they'll be able to recall it. So you mentioned, and I'll come on to, we've had a, actually, no, I'll do it now, actually, if it's okay with you. We've had, we've had an interesting question from, from Maria. Thank you for mentioning Kevin's question. Um, maybe we'll come back to that, actually, uh, at the end. But um, from Maria, thank you, Maria. How could you measure learning rather than performance? Are they separate things? Yeah, it's real interesting, isn't it? Because <laughs> you, you can't see learning, can you? Because no. the old... Um, <laughs> iceberg analogy isn't it that, yeah. that, that drawing of the iceberg you what you see the tip of the iceberg but you yeah, don't see what's underneath and the tip of the iceberg is the performance underneath is learning i think that to determine if something has been learned it you have to they, they suggest don't they that the cognitive science research suggests that people need to be exposed to something four to five times before it's actually been learned. Um, mm. And even then, if, if, if we don't revisit it, they can still, um, they can still uh, sort of lose that knowledge because we know there's the, the theory of disuse where um, if you don't use something, it, it will just naturally disappear. So it's a, that is a really tough question because what we're seeing is performance and we, we do want to know if they've learned something. But what I would say is, the more we expose people to it, and the more we give them opportunities to recall something, and the more we give them opportunities to use something in different contexts, the more we may have a, an understanding of whether that has been learned. So for example, if in geography, we, we talk about the fundamental um, foundation concepts of processes, pupils need to know the processes in order to be able to apply that to formation of landforms. So maybe like cliffs and wave foot platforms, meanders in uh, the bends in the rivers or waterfalls. When we've taught them that, if we don't revisit the processes, they won't be able to then apply it to those other different landforms. And what we want to do is continually uh, interleave those processes and continue to review those processes to enable them to apply it to different landforms. We might say that as pupils progress in, in the different um, disciplines of those physical uh, geography units, we would see greater flu fluidity and automaticity in applying those processes in a different context. And then we might say actually, well, pupils have, have now learned that, learned those processes because they're now able to use them fluently in those different uh, contexts in which they're given. I saw um... A.C. Grayling speak. I really like A.C. Grayling's work, modern philosopher at Wellington a few years ago. <clears throat> and he said, and it, struck, it really stuck with me, he said that um, education is not only about the acquisition of knowledge, it's about the acquisition of understanding. And that's different. <laughs> and that's maybe harder to see, isn't it? And it's, oh, it's rem reminiscent of your iceberg with, uh, with performance, the visible performance at the top, you know, what we can see and hear. And the learning is, is more deeply embedded. And I find that fascinating. And I know that's your quarry, isn't it? That's what you're after. That's what you want to see, you know. And um, we've had some great questions all along. Uh, and they're, they're coming in thick and fast, which is terrific. Thank you so much. Shall I just maybe explore a few of those before we go to final question from me? Is that okay, Mike? Yeah, we're, absolutely. We're grilling you now. Um, great one from Emma, actually. Uh, a sort of a point and a question. Um, thank you, Emma. Is learning to learn how we see learning is there not a place for metacognition? That is how we find out we're learning self-assessment. Where, where are you on that sort of, as I call it, dual learning, learning knowledge and learning how to learn at the same time? Where does, that, where does assessment fit into that? Gosh. Yeah, I think it's fundamental, <laughs> actually. And I, I talk about in the in, in, um, feedback pendulum that actually yeah. move yeah. away from this idea of peer and self-assessment because I think right. we get wrapped in the pupil see inevitably assessment has been something that's um that is ultimately a test and actually that's why i talk about the language that we use when we talk when we use assessment formatively in the classroom we want to move away from that high stakes sort of language 
but actually I talk about this idea of shifting that um, notion of uh, self and peer assessment to uh, gui guided uh, self and peer feedback and right. giving pupils opportunities to um, to reflect on their own work, to reflect on um, each other's work. And there was a there was a great quote um, where someone said, actually, in terms of like peer feedback, the power of just allowing each other to allowing each each of their friends to read the work they produce just to see the graduations and the differences between their work and and their peers work is really powerful to actually helping them to understand well what am i missing in my work what do i need to do um and uh it was a it was an incident a few um few, well, about two months ago a year 11 that that i that i'm currently teaching and uh I used a self-assessment strategy uh, on, on the year 11 that I'm teaching and I gave them some explicit success criteria and, and the learning intentions we know and sharing those are really powerful in terms of supporting assessment for learning. And uh, he, he, they, they were undertaking this exercise. I always get them to proofread their work as well. I always talk about the importance of proofreading before they hand something in. Um, and uh, he was proofreading it and he, and he said, oh, I said, what's up? He said, I've realised I haven't done this bit, sir. Now, I did tell him that, but he picked that out just because I'd gone through the importance of proofreading and why we're doing that, that those whole sort of metacognitive strategies. I'd gone through the reasons as to why in the past as well, assessments are structured like this and why we do this and why we do that. And I think that those, those sort of... Um, core sort of aspects of sharing that with pupils is really really important yeah i agree what, why am i teaching you like this what why am i getting you to do this activity why am i asking you these questions in this way why are we why are we doing this particular part of a lesson like this it's really really crucial absolutely i couldn't agree with you more on that one actually it's that sort of that meta awareness again that metacognition that um, being mindful learning, you might call it. I, I, I think that's so important, isn't it? And it's so powerful, the reflective learner. And I think pathway is all about the reflective practitioner, actually, really being mindful of your practice and of the impact and efficacy that you, know, you have. And that ties in really nicely with uh, your brilliant course, which is about the reflective learner. We've had a great question from Mark and then another one from Kelly and a few more in the chat stream as well. So uh, if I can maybe respectfully limit you to fairly short answers and then we'll try and get through as many as we can. I thought they might come in. Is that okay with you, Mike? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, you don't know what I'm going to ask you yet, but... Uh... <laughs> um, so, I'm Mark, there. is there a difference in the way skills should be assessed versus the way we assess knowledge? That's mm. an interesting... A lot of philosophical questions here. These are great. Mm. What do you I think? think? Yeah, it's interesting, that is, because... It is. In order for pupils to demonstrate a skill within our subject, they need to have the knowledge. Knowledge is yeah. the foundation, it's the crucial point, isn't it? Right. Um, so how we assess knowledge, I mean, for me in, in the practices uh, that I've seen and observed and that, that I'm undertaking now in my own classroom, because fundamentally I'm still learning as a, as a practitioner and I'm still reflecting on my own practice um, and how I effectively incorporate assessment strategies based on what I've read and researched yeah. and written about. Still learning. Yeah, still, absolutely. Still learning, still reflecting. I think when we're looking at knowledge, what we want to do is try and use, uh, move away from maybe lots of assessment strategies and, and use maybe those learning strategies of, of like retrieval practice and space practice. Because what we want to do is we want to give pupils uh, plenty of opportunities to recall knowledge um, yep. and talk about knowledge that they've been learning. Like we know that. Um, developing that oracy uh, is really important in lessons and, uh, and supporting that sort of vocab development. And then if I take an example in geography, if I want, if I want a student to evaluate something, I want them to evaluate um, mitigation and the adaptation strategies uh, for climate change. They need to know those strategies before they can evaluate them. So I want to teach them the strategies I want to give them plenty of opportunities to recall the strategies for retrieval practice. I want to get plenty of opportunities to, to question and, and do some peer feedback and sharing ideas and discussions. And then I want to work on, okay, so now I want to look at 
how can I uh, support the pupils to become really sort of uh, uh, powerful evaluators in geography? So I do, uh, fundamentally, I suppose, I do need to teach them how to evaluate in order for them to evaluate. But what I would say is, they are, they are I suppose there's two separate aspects to, isn't it? Teaching them the, uh, the knowledge, teaching them how to evaluate, how to be an effective evaluator in, in geography. And it might look slightly different uh, as a scientist, or it might look slightly different as a mathematician or, or a historian, we know that. So we do, I suppose, still need to teach them those fundamental skills for our subject. But unless they've got the knowledge, they won't be able to apply it to the, the different Terrific. skills we want them to demonstrate. Yeah, beautifully explained. Completely get that. I think uh, a lot of people on, on the call will, will, will really grasp that. One of the things that I was quite pleased about when I, this is, oh, this is 150 years ago when I was, well, not quite, but when I was looking at the, the primary, the national curriculum and so forth, we, I love the fact that in history, for example, there, there was historical knowledge to learn, but then there was also the opportunity to think historically, to think as a historian. So there's, there's geog geographic knowledge, isn't there? There's geography knowledge to learn, but then there's the opportunity to think as a geographer or to think scientifically rather than learn science. And I, I think it's a really important distinction to make. And uh, how might you, this is the killer question, how might you create some sort of assessment framework so that you can assess and observe them thinking as a geographer? rather than just assessing the knowledge that they've retained. That's, is that something you can assess? I think that uh, when they're evaluating or, or assessing or, or explaining or um, exploring the different elements of the subject, you'll have a success criteria. So right. you'll right. have a success criteria. This is what, this is what a good uh, geographer will demonstrate when they're evaluating in geography. Very good. Yeah. Have that success criteria. And so I suppose what, what I would say is you could use that success criteria to determine, are they demonstrating that skill effectively? And then I suppose you're looking at two core elements when you're, when, potentially when you're assessing uh, in any subject. Do, do, they, do they have a grasp of the knowledge? And in the example I gave, do they understand adaptation and mitigation strategies for climate change? So do I need to address some misconceptions there? Um, have they mixed up an adaptation strategy that is actually a mitigation strategy because maybe they demonstrate they don't understand the difference between those two terms so do I need to reteach that um, and do I need to go back to that and then secondly have they uh, evaluated effectively so do I need to reflect on the way in which they're evaluating so do I need to give them more opportunities uh, to demonstrate evaluative skills absolutely Yep. Brilliant. Brilliant. I'm going to keep going with the questions, I'm afraid, but I'm, I'm so grateful. Um, Kelly, thank you, Kelly. Um, great question here. So, so here we go. So if you were starting the journey now with your staff on embedding long term memory strategies and regular assessment for learning to inform teaching and planning, what would you say are your fundamental starting blocks to ensure success across the school? Where would you start if you were embedding a new assessment approach i would suppose it's it's about that change management isn't it in, in, in right. any sort of um, uh, act of, of leadership and, and implementing new plans so first of all what what do we what do we mean by those fundamental aspects of um learning what do we mean by that we actually interestingly we actually had um he was a memory champion. He, he did a session for our, our trust, uh, Dominic O'Brien, a famous memory champion. Um, okay. He did a session with our staff about memory palaces and the importance of helping pupils to develop um, approaches to memory. So I think, first of all, I'd, I'd look at what, what's the reason for change? What's the fundamentals of learning? What's the fundamentals of assessment? Um, and then how can we how can we apply that in uh, an effective way in the context of the school because i suppose the important thing as well and and um i'm glad i've got the opportunity to say this is that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach no. actually we know that there are certain formative strategies that may be more effective at certain points in time than others we know that um certain structures to assessment practices may be more effective than others in, in terms of the context of the school, the community in which it's working with. So 
I'm definitely not advocating a one size fits all approach to it. No, indeed. But I think that uh, if we want if we want staff to be on board and we want to make fundamental changes to things like that, we have to uh, share the underlying reasons for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, far too many questions for me to get them all in, but I'm absolutely thrilled. We're going to record. I know my my colleague Bobby's always always records these questions. And we will, um, I know you're an extremely busy person, but we may send you the questions. And if you have the time to respond, um, I know that will be much appreciated, but you're very busy. But let's go for a few more in, um, in the order in which they came in, I think is the fairest way. Very interesting one from Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Do we measure learning by seeing it used in different contexts? Is that important? Different settings, different contexts? Different settings is in, is in like phase or, or subject or... I, I think, um, well, I, I put in the word settings and maybe I shouldn't have done. Anthony's word is context. Do we measure learning by seeing it used in different contexts? Perhaps that's that mastery piece, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, because I think that um, that's what we want to see, don't we? We want to yeah. see that they, that pupils can use that, that knowledge that they've acquired in uh, different uh, scenarios and situations within the subject. Um, I think that's really important, yeah. And I think also that there's a, there's, I suppose, especially with um, mathematical skills, is probably a good example, actually, statistical skills. We know that um, uh, within the maths curriculum, pupils are taught how to do sort of um, central tendencies like uh, mean, median, moan, and so forth. Yeah. Um, but we know also that um, part of the geography curriculum um, and even the science curriculum has those statistical skills within them. But what, I mean, I often see this um, all the time, how much... Can pupils transfer what they've learnt in in maths into geography and Absolutely. in science? So, is it that they haven't learnt how to do mean, medium, mode effectively, or is it that just that they're struggling to transfer that learning from one discipline to another? Um, and I suppose that's that would be the question: Is it has it been learnt, or is it just they can't? They can't um, decompartmentalize it from being this is maths, this is geography, this is science. And actually, mm -hmm. because you see, I see it all the time. And I did a bit of an experiment where asking pupils, how do you calculate the mean in, in maths? Well, we do it like this. Well, why have you done it like this in geography? Um, oh, I don't know. Didn't know it was the same. And I suppose maybe we sometimes overlook those transferable. Um, Sort of skills that actually we could invest more time in to to support that learning process absolutely yeah absolutely yeah we'll take a couple more um <laughs> very mindful that you've had a busy day already teaching um <laughs> what this is an interesting one from susan thank you susan for your question what should we report to governors about assessment of attainment and progress i mean it, in a few short sentences what, what what do you think are the main elements we should be reporting back to governors I think schools, we, we are in a situation in schools, uh, in particular in the UK, where, and in particular England, where um, performance is based on, on how far pupils have progressed from their starting point. It's and I don't think in the near future we're going to get away from that. No. I think that um, as a school uh, that I'm in at the moment, it's probably the best reporting that I've seen to date in the 13 years of talk. Right. And um, we use something called quartiles and we, we uh, position pupils into, into quartiles based on, on the assessed um, tasks that they may have done. And I think that's really powerful to help um, determine where, where pupils are at in relation to uh, their peers and that particular work. And it's, it's moving away from that old traditional, are they on target or are they off target? And uh, are they at the grade we expect them to be at? Because actually it's about placing them into um, uh, quartiles based on that, that exercise, that assessment task they were doing, and then addressing in particular, if, you, if, we're, if we put them into the first, second and third and fourth quartile, as we do, those that are in the third and fourth quartile are the ones that maybe need um, those elements being retaught, yeah. they maybe need uh, some additional intervention uh, to support them in, in moving them up those quartiles in, in future assessments. Yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. 
Um, and I'm glad that you're 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 in a place at the moment where you're impressed by the assessment because I would think it would take quite a lot to Im impress you actually with your knowledge of assessment. Um, a really interesting one from Sally, which is very topical, I think. What would be your advice for assessment strategies being used to determine GCC enable grades this year on return to school? My gosh, that's topical, isn't it? Yeah, it is very topical. Where, where yeah. Are we still now? I've just done a, um, a national college uh, webinar actually on, on, on this whole well, subject around this topic. I think that um, we may fall in the trap of, of putting in place lots of assessments to determine where they're at to help us decide um, what target they should get and what grade they should get at the end of, um, end of the, uh, the process. But I think sticking to the fundamental principles that you have as a school that you've used in the past is really important. Um, and not trying to put too much effort into creating specific assessments just purely for this process, um, because we know that teachers over the last sort of uh, 12 months have got lots of inverted commas evidence, if, if, that's, if that's the language that's being used, to say where their pupils are at, and... Um, it won't necessarily help putting in place um, additional special assessments just to determine the grade they're at. No, no, I think you're right, actually. My gosh. And of course, you are experiencing this alongside everyone else. You, you have your own students that uh, need their GCC and A-level grades as well. So uh, we all wait um, eagerly to see how you found it and, uh, and how, you, how you write about it and how you articulate it. I think we're going to learn from that. Um, absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Why don't we take one more and then we must crack on if that's okay. And we must let you go because we've gone over time already. And I have just a few bits and bobs to share at the end. Um, but it's, it's regarding Ofsted actually, I saw, um, where did I see? I did see it earlier on actually higher up. Um, thank you from Natalie. Is Ofsted on board with a shift in long-term memory, therefore learnt? Not sure what that means. So are they still are they still looking for progress in lessons? Yes. Is there going to will there still be that tremendous focus on progress in lessons? Because progress isn't linear, is it? It goes no, up and down. I think, and yeah, I mean, the most recent Ofsted uh, handbook and, and um, all the um, sort of uh, literature coming from Ofsted over the last few years has recognised that actually um, research-based approaches and, and uh, informed practices is important and actually they do use that definition of um, uh, learning as a change in long-term memory yeah right. so I'd, I think and obviously I can't speak for Ofsted I can't say that mm -hmm. yes they are or, or, or no they're not but I would hope that uh, inspectors um, recognize now that we won't see learning in a lesson. So when we're talking about progress, what do we mean by the word progress? Because um, just because a pupil at the end of a lesson, and, and uh, I mean, I was really sort of uh, um, guilty of this, just because I might do a little quiz at the end of the lesson and they might be able to recall all of those processes and they get five out of five in that lesson, but whatever I'm, I've taught them doesn't mean that they made progress, doesn't mean that they've learned it. What it means is they can perform at that given time. But then two weeks down the line, when I ask them again, they might not be able to recall it and they might not be able to recall it, not at any fault of their own, but it might be because there's not been opportunities to recall and practice it. Absolutely. It might be because there's, uh, they've, they've gone through hours and hours of other lessons and not had any opportunity to review it at home. So I think when we start to use the word progress in lessons, um, I would hope that that sort of um, analogy of learning is has gone from Ofsted's criteria. Brilliant. Great summary. Yeah, it's a, it can be a very unhelpful word sometimes. <laughs> Um, Mike, I'm really, really grateful. Thank you. I'm sorry we went over time slightly, um, but a great many people uh, are still on the call and we really appreciate that. Um, as everyone else, if you're able to stay on the call for, for a bit longer, everybody, I'm going to just have a little bit of a chat about uh, Pathway and I'll mention Mike's brilliant Pathway course as well. And while I'm doing that, if you want to read other people's questions, if you want to reach out to each individual individually, please feel free to answer each, other question, each other's questions that haven't been, that haven't been covered. I always encourage that. 
Um, and I think um, this has proven that we need to have you back again soon, Mike. <laughs> I know you're in demand, but I'll join the queue because I think it'd be useful to have a part two soon, actually. I think people would value that. Uh, but uh, great comments coming in. Thanks, Michael. Fantastic chat. chat. Thank you. Um, so some nice, lovely comments coming in from people who have clearly appreciated your time and valued it as much as we have. So thank you ever so much, Mike. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and I do hope you get some time off at some stage this evening. <laughs> And thanks yeah, thank again. you for inviting me and uh, thanks to everyone that's come and joined us and uh, I hope it was uh, hope it was helpful and um, if you want to ask me questions or maybe carry on the conversation on Twitter feel free to tweet me absolutely and, uh, more than happy to and how do they reach you on Twitter again what's your what's your so, uh, at uh, m underscore Charles at m underscore Charles there we are I'm sure you will hopefully have uh, lots of people discussing things with you as, uh, as you should that's brilliant thank you very much Mike thank you thanks very much for joining us Cheers. Great. Well, we'll um, we wish Mike a good evening. Um, I think he's done terrifically well, hasn't he? He really has, um, uh, coping with many, many interesting questions there. Um, so I hope you can see my screen. I'm just going to very quickly, for those who still have the time, I just want to flag up a few events that are coming up soon, which uh, I'd love you uh, not to miss. Those of you on the call who've experienced um, webinars with Guy Guy uh, before, Guy Dudley, uh, head of uh, advice at the NHT, will know that they are extremely insightful, very useful, very interesting, very jocular, lots of fun. And we have some interesting quizzes about what's on your mind at the moment. So uh, do join us for that, 16th of March. Can't wait to see Guy again for another one. Um, that's going to be terrific. And if uh, you're able and you're available, uh, please do, uh, and you're able to, uh, to attend, please do uh, see Mike at the NHT School Leaders Summit on... Uh, 18th of March and those who are uh, looking to subscribe to the Pathway program uh, you might be interested to know that you'll actually get free access into that conference or a different NHT course of your choice but that's a nice little promotion there so um, we're grateful to the NHT for offering that to Pathway subscribers so hopefully you'll see Mike then um, and we have the brilliant Dave McPartlin uh, bags of fun can't wait to sit down and have a conversation with Dave um, you may have seen Dave's brilliant children on the uh, um, Britain's Got Talent uh, a little while ago and Dave uh, has a tremendous culture of uh, dare to dream and a tremendous, uh, tremendously happy school. So I'm going to be sitting down and really talking to Dave about how he's established this culture of aspiration, culture of uh, daring to dream. So we're going to have a really nice fireside chat and really get, to get a sense of uh, what makes him tick and what makes his school tick. So I can't wait to do that. I hope you can join us for that on the 23rd of March. And just briefly, in the last few moments, I'm just going to quickly mention uh, the Discovery Education Pathway, which, uh, if you're not aware of it, uh, it's a new online program supporting professional and personal development, which we're really proud to have worked on in the last, uh, well, over 12 months now it's taken to put this together. And essentially what we're doing uniquely, I hope, is we're blending professional development with personal development too. And I'll explain what I mean by that. And I think when you combine the two elements, I really genuinely feel that you're able to give teachers that all important empowerment and agency. A lot of people think teachers just need autonomy. That's, that's, I, I think personally, with respect, I think it's actually agency. It's not just not being told what to do. I think it's actually knowing that the efforts that you're going to are actually having the impact that you want them to have on the teachers. So it's that reflective practice, practice again, isn't it? And uh, I think what we're trying to do is really build that professional learning journal that teachers can really understand the impact that they're having in, in assessment too, and of course, Mike has done this brilliant course on assessment for learning within the Pathway Programme. So how do we do that? Well, we actually help you to orientate your career by helping you to identify your motivations, audit your professional skills, and map out your career ambitions using our career mapping tools. And then we present you with multiple different online courses, many, many courses, all for the same subscription every year with more content being added each year. Um, and then we are, invite you to re reflect on your practice really by looking at your well-being and developing those all important critical reflection skills and accessing the most amazing, amazing advice hub, which is authored by Guy Dudley, funnily enough. Uh, and when you combine those elements together, I genuinely think uh, uh, you're creating this ongoing, constant, uh, continuous professional empowerment, as I call it, CPE. This is the orientation section, just to begin with. I mean, these are just photos from the actual site. There's a guide to motivation, a skills audit, two different skills audits, a teacher skills audit and a leadership competencies audit. And then those career mapping tools where you're invited to write down the professional roles and goals that you have, 
the extracurricular activities that keep you motivated that you bring where you bring so much added value to school all those other sports and drama and all those other things you wish to do in the years ahead and then also your health and well-being goals which are so important and uh, not to be ignored these are just some of the courses that we run every course is run with a, a a real expert practitioner who's uh, so experienced in their particular area. And these are, these are some of them. Um, I'll give you a moment just to have a look at those. You'll see some very big generic titles rather than subject specific at the moment, although we will do that in time. We'll do, you know, maths at key stage two and science at key stage three and so on. But we thought we'd start with some of the really big generic titles that will appeal um, with some terrific authors. Uh, and you'll see Mike Charles is in there on assessment for learning. And every course, is comprised of an introduction, uh, a roundtable discussion, another one-to-one -one discussion, another, another discussion, and then an interview, and then a, an outro. And uh, every film is accompanied by reading materials where you read the introduction, you watch the film, you read the thought piece, the academic piece of writing, and then the answer those questions for reflection. So every film is accompanied by very interesting questions to encourage you to really reflect and think about your own practice and your own experiences. Because as we found, teaching isn't just about what you know, it's about what you can do with what you know. And we think that's inextricably bound up with how you feel. So we take a coaching approach rather than a masterclass telling you how to do it. <laughs> I think that's really the style of pathway. Round tables all the way. So this is the brilliant reflection section with uh, Professor Tim O'Brien and his writing partner, Dr. Dennis Guiney. They've done the most amazing, unique wellbeing program, which you, you study online and you complete some questions for reflection, watch these fantastic filmed conversations that we've had with Tim and Dennis and find out what wellbeing actually means and what critical reflection looks like. And then finally that advice hub with Guy Dudley with a whole range of important areas where you can get the very latest uh, pieces of advice on those important areas of teaching and learning and leading in schools today. And these are just some shots from some of the roundtables that we have. And we genuinely feel that by asking you coaching questions for reflection to complete as you're watching, we hope you feel that you're included and you're part of the discussion, which is what it's all about. So authored and presented by authentic leaders and teachers sharing the knowledge and expertise in discussions and reflections. It's delivered online with individual logins so you can work through each course at a time and pace to suit you. And unlike a lot of uh, online courses, they don't end and disappear when you finish them. They're still there, they're bookmarked. You can keep coming back to them and change your responses as you progress in your career. And it's absolutely at its heart. Fundamentally, it's about self-investment and uh, critical reflection and positive well-being. It's not a self-indulgence to look after yourself. I think that the students and your families at home deserve that. So we hope that uh, with Pathway, you're going to really flourish and feel empowered throughout your career. If you'd like to find out more, please do. Uh, I know my colleague has been sharing a link in the chat to a place where you can visit in order to actually, um, excuse me, actually find out more about Pathway and book a no obligation chat, a discussion with uh, our team to find the team at the NHT actually to find out more about the Pathway program with no obligations, just to get a sense of what it really is and be walked through uh, all its functions and features and to understand how it's very quick and very easy to uh, to order and how you can get your hands on it. And it's uh, if, if I'd still been in teaching, I, I left about a year, just over a year ago, having had 21 years as a teacher and as a school leader, I would have certainly found this extremely empowering, I must admit, and great fun to do. So do get in touch if you'd like. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar, uh, as I've mentioned. And uh, I hope you enjoy your evening. And thank you so much for staying this long. There's still a great many people here. And I hope you enjoy uh, the evening and you're able to grab just a little bit of daylight. Thanks very much for joining. See you next time.